Uh, I'm Andrea Hoxley. I'm part of LVR. You probably saw Emily speak briefly yesterday and Vi is going to talk, I think, a lot about stuff we do in the closing keynote session. But I'm going to talk about a little bit about how we do some of the stuff we do and from a really basic level. So this is geared more towards people who face very little or no coding or about VR experience. Um, some coding experience is probably a little useful, but I'm going to go over some things that you probably don't need. So first, who am I? Um, I usually think of myself as a software developer by trade. I went to MIT and a mathematical artist as a hobby. As far as I can tell, the most popular thing I've ever done was Fibonacci Lemonade, which has basically nothing to do with VR, but <laughs> makes me look like I'm trying to levitate or magic a cup of lemonade. Uh, the idea is that as you drink down the drink, it gets progressively sweeter and more lemony according to the Fibonacci sequence, so you have a stronger beverage. Um, sometimes people tell me it should have been a stronger alcoholic beverage when you're running workshops for kids. It's not a good idea if you want to try that at home. I leave that up to you. Um, more relevantly for this workshop, I'm part of LVR, and that is the, all of us. Uh, Vi, Emily, me, my uh, baby is carefully labeled, but he doesn't actually help. He's more counterproductive, realistically. Uh, Evelyn, who just joined us this month, and in the picture in picture is Elijah Butterfield, who is our fun intern who's worked with us off and on during summers. Is currently a student at UC Berkeley. And LVR is sort of the VR researching, exploring, making cool stuff part of HARP, the human advancement research community. I got that right. <laughs> It's hard and you never expand an acronym and you're just like, oh yeah, it's hard. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. um, and that is a bunch of us in little puppet form. And there, we're doing a lot of different but somewhat related things, ranging from this lively kernel to, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Red Vectors, where I put Red Works in our group. Um, and Alan Kay is in the back as our spiritual godfather. <laughs> so let's get started on the real part of this workshop, a gentle introduction to web VR. And just to start off, um, I assume you've all been around so you have some sense of what web VR is. Anyone not have any idea? It's basically VR for the web. And it has both pros and cons. So the pros are that anything you write for the web is more or less hardware agnostic. Just like the same way if you make a website now, you expect that you're going to be able to read it on your phone, you expect that you're going to be able to see it on a Mac, on Linux, but like the, what you're using shouldn't make a difference. Uh, when you make something for the web, hopefully you're hoping that your browser is handling that how it's actually connecting and you have a standard set of APIs. Um, and it's easy for the users, just like any website is these days, because a lot of VR experiences, you have to go and download it, and you're like, oh my god, this is so slow. <laughs> and, and you finally download it, and now it's taking up space in your hard drive. With WebVR, like anything in the cloud, it's mostly hosted by somebody else on someone else's computer, um, which gives you all of the usual benefits, like open and accessible links. It's just the benefits of the web in general. Um, the cons on some of these will hopefully slowly get better. Lag, um, you're using something from someone else and it's not native and it's just inherently going to be slower. Um, obviously, as with anything, if we consider the flow of stuff over time, it's probably going to gradually get faster and for a lot of things you're using, it's not going to make a difference. But if you're trying to make the next super graphics intensive uh, you know, first-person shooter game it might not be the right choice for you. Uh, the development stack is this especially relevant if you already have experience in, say, Unity, and you don't know JavaScript or WebGL or any of the HTML stack, uh, you are stuck using that because that's what it is. Um, <laughs> and the last one, which is 
slowly going away is that it's really still under development. Not all browsers support it. The API is still being changed, although hopefully it'll eventually stop having drastic changes that break everything happen to it. And at the bottom of this page, I have a link, which is where you can go and see whether or not WebVR is ready. Um, I just love that that website actually exists. And for this workshop, we're going to be focusing on developing content using 3JS, which was developed by Mr. Dube, AKA, or I guess Ricardo, um, <laughs> AKA Mr. Dube, this goes that way, right? Um, who, I don't know if he made it to this room or not, um, but he did give a workshop yesterday, and it's, this deck is pretty awesome. And the main advantages, which I enumerated, are just that like, it's really well built out and it has most of the things you don't have to like think about, oh, now I want a cube, and first let me generate some triangles and um, you know, write my own shaders. Um, additionally, because 3JS is a JavaScript library, and it's basically hidden all of the uh, WebGL from you, you don't have to learn WebGL, at least not on any kind of deep level or any GLSL which if you are starting off with not knowing any programming, to being like, yes, and you have to learn this thing and this thing and this other thing, it's a little crazy. You only need to know JavaScript, and that's easier. Also, from experience, like straight WebGL is basically the worst thing to debug. Um, it's really bad. Um, and, uh, and this, I have to give a lot of credit, it's one of the best and well-documented and thorough open source libraries of like, I mean, people open source things all the time, and writing documentation is always like, everyone's least favorite thing. It's really well documented, um, which is convenient. And if you're still dubious about WebVR, I'm going to give a few examples of things that you can do with WebVR, just so that you're not like, oh, but you can't make anything serious because the performance is so bad. Um, and this first project is called Hypernom, and you can go this on your phone. And so you can see it looks something like this. This is the non-web VR mode. Uh, and it starts you off with a shape, which I don't know, does anyone recognize it who's not Vi? Uh, this is a 120 cell from awfully close up. And I can back up because I'm using the cheating keyboard control so you can see it from further away. This is not what you can normally do. Normally, uh, when you open it in VR, you're stuck to a kind of peculiar set of motions because your VR thing is giving you rotation. And so you're rotating it in, around, and, um, like maybe to your left, and it's gonna look kind of like this, where you're going around in a circle, and it's spiraling. And that's because this is a four-dimensional object, and we made a choice that when you have your headset position in, in rotation, you can get it as a quaternion, which is four values, which is really convenient in four dimensions. So as you go around here, we're actually using the quaternion to define where your projection is from in this four-dimensional space. Um, there's a lot more technical details that I'm not going to get into here, but you can look the project up if you want to see more of that. Uh, how do I go back to the, whatever? Um, screen is no. Whoa. Um, and because you have to do weird rotations to try and get to every location, it becomes sort of a game where you try to get all of them, and people end up upside down, like by, and it looks really silly, which should be anyone's goal in making a VR game, at least once. Um, the first web VR project we did was actually this, though, and this is the LVR player, because we started off doing mostly videos and spherical video, and we needed a way to play this video, and when we started off, there just wasn't that much available. Like, really not that much available. This was written so long ago that the web VR browsers weren't available, and we were still trying to 
do it in VR. So originally we were doing this complicated thing involving using someone else's open source browser extension to connect the Oculus information to your browser. Um, but it lets you play videos and this video that is being played right now is actually one of the very first videos I think that we made. Possibly the first really spherical one? I don't remember. Yeah, first, yeah, first really spherical one. Um, and this is in San Francisco at the Botanical Conservatory. And you can see it still works fairly well. And this, this actually doesn't use 3JS. This is how I know that WebGL is annoying to debug. Mm -hmm. um, and because we did this so early, I get to have a title as like one of the very first people to be doing WebVR. And also, this is definitely the first web player for a video because no one else was crazy enough to do it before there was actually WebVR browsers even announced. Um, uh, and then another project, just to show greater variety, this is a newer project that we've worked on, and it's called Float. And Float was written for the HTC Vive. So up until now, we've been showing experiences that were written sort of with this like Oculus DK1 or your phone in mind where you don't have any positional tracking. Um, but the web does support positional tracking. You can move around in space if your headset supports it. And Float is an example of something with that kind of positional tracking. This is our website, by the way, if you want to learn more about us. So here you can see by moving around and one view, and you can also see this, and like it's growing. Move over here is better. So you can see that she's able to move around the space with the headset on. And this is fairly easily supported by WebVR. If you make your experience, it will have a location where the position is, and it just will move around with your camera. And you don't just have position tracking, you also have the controllers. Um, so this is uh, apparently one of the very first things we made after I added controller support to the boilerplate that we use, uh, which is a drawing tool because everybody's first thing they make after adding controller support is a drawing tool. Mm -hmm. It like literally is because like you're just like, oh my gosh, controller, I can see where it is. Wow, if I just track where it is, I've made a line. That is amazing. And I think everyone has done it. And this one is sort of a nostalgic version of a drawing tool because uh, I was a kid in the 90s, and so were the other members of our group for the most part. And back then, you know, there was like this, anyone remember Kid Fix? Anyone else from this era? And like the early versions of MS Paint, and they were like, you know, janky and old, and like they had this like sort of style to them. So this drawing tool was meant to evoke uh, the experience of drawing in Confix. Another thing that I've done with the controllers, which is much more simple, but I just bring it up because I think that this is, I love this project, um, even though it took like half an hour to implement, mm -hmm. um, is Marco Polo. I like to think of it as like the first version of Marco Polo accessible to deaf people, because what happens is I was sitting around one day and being like, man, have you ever been to those demos and there's just people in VR and it's like everyone's waiting in line and there's one person who's able to participate in the headset. And like, you go to someone's house and they're like, yeah, I totally got this like new headset and it's awesome. Let me show it to you. And then everyone's just sitting there and like, you're waiting to take your turn. It's really awkward. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, well, why isn't there something like, you know, you spend so much money, no one can buy two headsets usually. Uh, at this point, like something that's more for multiple players. And the first, or one of several ideas we came up with was one where we just like, okay, well, there's a, on the HTC Vive, you have a headset and you have two controllers, so let's split them up, right? One person gets the headset, two more people get controllers, now we're all split up. And the person with the headset on now is just basically looking at nothing. We're treating this headset as a blindfold because have you seen them? They're basically a blindfold. You can't see like even someone would be making funny faces at you and making fun of you and you would have no idea. And the two people with the controllers 
are going to just wander around and try to avoid getting caught by the person with line pole. Kind of like Marco Polo when you have your eyes closed. Except here, you don't have to say Marco Polo. You can just like, you know, wave your hand and the person with the controller triggers it. And when you trigger the controller, it causes that to show up briefly in the VR environment. So you trigger your controller, there's a dot, and then like the person with the blind belong on trust, like grab the person at the dot, and it leads to all kinds of fun interactions where one person is like, controller, that <laughs> way we're here now. Um, which is, you have to be a little tricky about it because like it does keep track of your controller if you move it too fast. So, you, and it shows for, I think, like, 20 milliseconds or something, so you need to keep it there for 20 milliseconds before you move it or else the brain know which way you're going. Um, just examples of the kinds of things you can make. And finally, I included this project because I gave an intro of VR workshop earlier this year and uh, one person actually made a project and posted it online and told me about it. Maybe someone else made a project and posted it online and didn't tell me, but this is the only person I know who actually like went with the workshop and made a project, and I thought it was really neat. It takes advantage of your camera rotation, uh, so like the rotation of your VR headset to change these planes in space, 